So good evening, everyone. Welcome. Uh, if I haven't had a chance to meet you, uh, my name is Pelin and uh, I've been uh, teaching and uh, studying here at the practice for about uh, a year and a half now. And um, today is my first presentation. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, you know, actually, if uh, two years ago you had told me that I would give a PowerPoint presentation with lights on me like that, which kind of blind me and I cannot really see you, and um, a presentation about spirit, spirituality, what lies about, uh, beyond the mind, I would have uh, laughed out loud and uh, say, no way, there's no way. And the truth is that this is not really my thing. It's not. It's not my thing to share in that way. I don't feel very comfortable. I find it hard um, to find the words and be systematic so that you can understand me. I can, I can get a bit like blurred, foggy. So yeah, it's not really my way. But I thought I'm going to give it a try and see how I come out at the end of this. And probably I'll be another person I know. So, beyond the mind. So the mind. The mind is really a hard concept to grasp because it's not something you can, something tangible. It's very hard to describe and there are many maps trying to describe the mind. It's not as if, you know, I was trying to describe the body. I can't say we have three, three arms. But with the mind, even in the yoga tradition, there are different maps to explain it. Even the same word can refer to different things. So it makes it a bit complicated when we try to systematize it. So that's one thing. And also, even worse, I'm trying to speak about what is beyond it. What is beyond the mind. So what is beyond it is so vast, it's infinite, it has no name and a thousand names. It is everywhere and nowhere. So I wonder how, and you can't grasp it with words actually, it's impossible to talk about it. So I'm really wondering how I'm going to do this. And actually, you know, I prepared this, I've been preparing this for quite some time now. And uh, just an hour ago, I erased uh, a third of the, the slides. I did. Like, that's, that's what happened. A third of them. So, I was like, yeah, how I, am I going to do this? Sometimes it didn't feel quite right and I was trying and I'm like, ah, okay, gone. So, let's say that actually, today I'm going to fail, and I will. It's going to be a failure, but it's going to be a noble one, a graceful failure. Because really my, my aim, and that's what I realized, is um, not to give you all the answers, because I really don't have them. You know, I... I, I it's not that I thought I had them, but I, I thought, yeah, I'm going to bring all this together and give the answer so that people can live and be happy and, you know. And actually, I don't have them. And I realize that my aim here is not to give you all of those answers, but maybe to let you live with questions and even with questions that you didn't have before. Even worse. You have more questions. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that's what's going to happen probably. So live with more questions and 
what I want you to do to sit is to sit with those questions and sit and sit. And if you sit long enough, you will receive the answers. I want, in, I want to inspire you to practice, to inquire. This is self-inquiry. This is experiential. You have to do it. I can't tell you what it is. It's impossible. I don't even really want you to believe me. I don't. Just don't believe me. Please, and go and inquire. Inquire. In your own way. There are different ways. I'm going to present one way and a few aspects of it, actually not as much as I thought I would. But that's, that's, my, that's my aim tonight. So sorry if this is not going to meet your expectations, but this is how it's going to be. And there's actually one quote that I wrote down here that I really like, and it's by Yogananda, who said that one ounce of practice is worth a ton of theory. So that's a bit what I'm wanting to say here. And this is stuck. Yes. So, so if you think that I got all this figured out, no, I don't. And I, I, I really, it's not too late. You can walk out. <laughs> Just you can walk out now and I won't feel uh, offended. I really won't. I don't have this figured it out. Because actually, you know, the reason why probably I'm in interested in that subject, which is kind of paradoxical, is because my mind is really very busy. It is. I mean, and sometimes it's really, I mean, spinning even. It's spinning, spinning. No matter, you know, how much I know, I've been, you can say she's a yogi, she's teaching at the practice. And still, you know, my mind is spinning. It is. And uh, one way to address that for me and to be more compassionate because you don't want to, if you kind of fight that, it would make this worse. So one way to start working with it is just understand why it is spinning. Why? And uh, I inquired. And you can do the same for yourself. I mean, maybe your mind is not spinning, but it has a quality. And why is your mind functioning this way rather than that way? Maybe you can inquire. And for me, the mind is, is spinning because um, it's when I feel uh, overwhelmed. If I feel overwhelmed or there's something I can't take in, I break it down with my mind. I want to, I try to break it down because it's so much, it's so overwhelming, I can't take it. So I have to analyze, try to understand why this, why that. It makes it smaller in a way, but it doesn't really help. And sometimes I repeat the same thing, like I have one thought, there's something I can't take in, like feel. And the same thought, I mean the same sentence repeats in my head over, 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 over again. So, you know, I could go crazy and go like, wow, that's intense more. But what I realize and the reason why I can kind of still go like this and be more compassionate is because I, um, towards myself, is because I know where it comes from. And for me, but you can inquire for you, it's a coping strategy that comes from really far. Uh, quite far, you know, maybe child, a bit like, yeah, as a child, because there were things I couldn't take in. And then I tried to do it differently or to think, to say, oh, try to almost tell a story about it so that it's not so hard to, to feel the whole thing. So 
that's a good way to start. So the monkey mind. So we all experience it in uh, one way or the other, this monkey mind. Um, and it's a metaphor for, you know, for this mind which is spinning, which is going from one thing to another. And I don't know if you know, but I, I, I didn't count this, but from research we have about 70,000 to 80,000 thoughts a day, which is really a lot. And most of those thoughts are even repetitions of the day before. And for me, probably a lot is repetition from the day before. So it's a lot. But if you start fighting the mind and you use your willpower, your willpower to stop it, it will never, ever work. Never you will create almost a um, civil war. It will, inside of you, something will, yeah, there will be a war, create more tension. It will make things even worse. You can't fight it that way. You can't reject. It's, it's, it's not going to work. And you know it. You've all tried in that way. We have all, all tried. Stop, 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 and no. Even worse, comes back, it comes back, spin more, spin more. So what we need to see is like that the mind is a beautiful instrument, but that we can be slaves of it. We don't want to be slaves of it. We want to use it in a way that serves us. And, for example, for that, as I said, you can't say, uh, tell the mind to stop like this. It won't. You can't fight it. It will hit you back. So what you can do is use strategies and method methodologies to calm it down. Simple ones. This is not too complicated. It's later on that I'm like, oh my God, how am I going to tell this? <laughs> this is quite simple. So... Moon. Uh, you've probably seen here at the practice that uh, we have uh, moon classes. And um, those moon classes have been designed actually to calm down the mind, to calm down the nervous system. Kind of tell your brain that, you know, it's, it's safe, it can relax, it can stop spinning. And uh, it really kind of grounds and quiets everything down. So this is the moon. And um, here at the practice, we say the moon is the first stage of the practice. So you do first the moon, and then it feels like you're done with that, and then you continue. But this is not what we mean, actually. You... That's why I wrote it down. Take the moon with you and take it with you at all times, all the time. Because you need it at all stages of the practice, all stages of life. You know, even in life, at some point you feel comfortable, you feel like everything is, is going on well the way you, you want it, so you feel quite, you know, calm and steady, and, and bam, life throws something at you, no matter how advanced you are in the practice. So there, moon. Take it with you wherever you go. And so for me, a skillful yogi or an advanced yogi, because it feels like this is at the first stage. And you're like, oh, okay, moon, I'm done with it. A skillful yogi is the yogi who knows exactly what it needs and when. It's not necessarily the yogi who goes to the advanced practices or classes. It can be as well, of course, but it's not necessarily that. 
that's a master yogi who knows what it needs and who knows which kind of medicine to apply, not to the disease, but to the, um, to the states in which you are, which, what you need. So, let's just go into moon and see what we're doing there and how, we, how it works. So, in uh, moon practices, you, some of you have been to moon practices, uh, we mainly focus on forward folds and twists. Because when we do that, we bring the awareness in the abdomen, in the lower belly. And this has a really grounding effect. And it also allows to bring the breath, we also bring the breath down in the belly and lengthen our exhalations, long exhalations. And when you do so, when you breathe in that way, with longer exhalations, what happens is that you switch on the parasympathetic nervous system. So it's kind of switching on the part of your brain, um, sending a signal to your brain as I said before, that it's okay to relax. And just to know that, you can tap into it whenever you want. Because the breath is always with you. Always, always. It doesn't have to be complicated. So each time you feel, you know, too much agitation, you can do that. And it really helps. Then maybe it doesn't really stay there. You know, it's, that's the thing to stabilize. You need to, to practice more or really, um, it's not like, you know, you feel, uh, you feel stressed, you breathe that way and it stays. It's a bit, you know, you need to add a few other elements, but it will help for sure. So remember, breath in the belly to calm down and long exhalations. And Mula Banda also helps to uh, bring the awareness down in the lower parts because that gives you a feeling of groundedness. And this Mula Banda is actually, you know, a, is a lift of the pelvic floor. So when you exhale, actually, if you try and you lengthen your exhale and you draw the navel in, there's the pelvic floor that is gently lifting. This is the root lock or Mula Banda. And it brings your awareness down from here down here. So it has a grounding effect and a very calming effect. And um, you know, when I was uh, preparing this uh, slide, I was like, wow, moon, it's interesting. And I had a, a question like that, you know, a question came and I was like, what if the moon disappeared? Like here, you know, if the Earth didn't have a moon, what happens actually, you know, scientifically? What happens? I didn't know, and I just learned a few days ago, and it's super interesting. I was like, I couldn't believe it. Maybe some of you know, I didn't, and I'm not, you know, an expert in that field at all. But actually, if the, the moon, what the moon does to the Earth, it's the, uh, is um, that it uh, slows down the spinning of the Earth. Can you believe that? If there was no moon, the Earth would spin faster and our days would be six hours long. And that would have consequences on our life, which are not necessarily uh, optimal. So more spinning. And the other one is also that the moon stabilizes us, like the moon from the practice. And I didn't know that. Let me just explain briefly. I can't go in, the, in details, but actually, the, I, you know maybe that the, the, the earth is not straight. It has a tilt. It's not like this. It has a tilt. It's uh, um, turning around an axis, but it's tilted. And this tilt is about 23 degrees. So what happens is that uh, if the moon is not there anymore, there will be more variation in the tilt. 
And this would mean that uh, the season would change a lot, for example. A lot of change in the season, uh, the climates would be different. So this moon, even the moon that we have, that has an, this, the same effect on the Earth, slowing down the spinning and stabilizing it, which is amazing, I find. <laughs> so. So what is the mind? Um, what is its nature, its um, structure and functions? Um, There's probably a lot of suffering because we don't quite understand how the ma mind functions. And you know, it's a bit like you left to play with fire and you don't know what it is. You don't know what it is. You play with fire and there's a lot of chances that you might get burnt. With the mind, it's a bit like this. And in order to understand the mind, uh, one thing that might be useful is to understand the, um, the forces in nature, the fundamental forces in nature. And I will explain more about it. So those nature, those forces, sorry, the primal forces of nature are called the gunas. So this comes from Ayurveda and the Samkhya philosophy upon which everything that we teach here is based. So those are the, the primal forces of nature. And everything in the universe, everything is a combination of those three forces to different degrees. And uh, our mind also uh, works through, uh, through those forces. Same thing, through those energies. It also contains them. So it's um, quite uh, useful to kind of understand th those forces and their qualities. To, so that you, you can also understand what our mind uh, is made of. So tamas, um, tamas is a, a quality of inertia, dullness, stuckness, darkness. So in the mind, I let you imagine how it can look like. So kind of, you know, a dull mind, um, kind of foggy, uh, maybe not very inspired. And those are the neg negative qualities of this. But it's also important to, to know that tamas is a necessary force. It also has a positive uh, aspect to it, which is this quality of kind of grounding, because it's quite heavy. Rajas. So Rajas is the quality of momentum, uh, action and change and this is what actually creates um, imbalance so that then we can, this change happening. And um, it creates this imbalance and in the mind, it can be, you know, you can think as a rajasic mind as quite active and uh, maybe sometimes agitated, active, agitated, and for a, for a rajasic mind, uh, it's quite, for instance, it's quite uh, difficult to meditate. It's, it feels difficult because the mind is not steady. So you don't want to be seated uh, in, a, in a, just sit and be quiet. It's, it's, it's really hard. Whereas for a tamasic uh, mind, it's also very hard. Tamasic mind would fall asleep in meditation.
And sattva um, is what you want. <laughs> it's when you are in your zone, kind of. It's balance, clarity. And you'd like, the, the aim would be to operate from that point, from that sattvic point. And from there, draw on what you need. Because sattvic doesn't mean like you're just staying there and doing nothing. It's just that you are, fr from that perspective of clarity, you know when you need more rajas. So you need to be active, you need to be outgoing, you need to, be, to do a presentation. So you need some rajas. Or sometimes, uh, maybe you need more tamas. You need to relax. But always operate from that uh, sattvic point and draw from each one. So what we tend to do is kind of swing between rajas and tamas. We swing between them. And the goal would be to establish ourselves in sattva, in that point of not equilibrium, but you know what I mean, kind of a more clear, uh, balanced position. So, as I said, if one, uh, one of those gunas predominates, then we tend to see the, the world through that lens. We see, we see the world how we, how, our, um, how we feel and how we're through our thoughts. If our thoughts are negative or if we feel dull, then you will see the world through that lens. And the thing is that also I wanted to mention that this sattvic point, which would be, you know, let's say being virtuous. And there's a danger to that. Ultimately, actually, we don't want to even attach to that because we want to go beyond. Even because if you start attaching to being virtuous, then you are bound. This is not freedom. The ultimate goal, and I know that this is difficult and I'm not there at all, but I kind of feel it somehow, and I, but I'm not there, would be to be there, to be beyond sattva and really understand with your guts and your heart that everything is exactly as it's supposed to be. Tamas is useful for some reasons. Rajas is useful. They are all meant to be there how they are. That there's not good and bad. That it's all exactly how it's supposed to be. And that all those forces, they have to be there the way they are there. But it's quite hard to, to wrap our minds around that. Especially when we're thinking of really negative stuff. Think of negative events, how we react to them. So here, just um, a simple explanation, and it's quite um, uh, basic here, what I, I did, just to explain what we're doing in the yoga practice. But this is general. I'm not going specific in a type of yoga practice, uh, moon, sun, or fire. So here... When you come to a yoga class, usually, you know, we, you're doing asanas. So it's physical postures. And when you do this, actually, you're clearing physical blockages. And you're really um, getting into your body, feeling the body. And in that way, also, you start deepening your relationship to breath. You're more embodied, so you feel you can connect to your breath. And then through the breath, you can 
connect to the mind. You have an influence on your mind. Because the way you breathe really has an impact on the way you feel. It has an impact. Depending on how you breathe, how you choose to breathe, you will impact the, the mind and your nervous system in different ways. So as I said, if you need to calm down and switch on the parasympathetic nervous system, you will breathe in the belly. If you need more energy action, a sympathetic nervous system, there you will breathe in the chest and deepen your inhalations. And then the last uh, part is meditation. So once your uh, nervous system is balanced, that you're not freaking out, because it's really hard to, to feel God or whatever is beyond when you're freaking out. It's very hard. I don't know if you've tried freak out and feel God. Let me know how you go. <laughs> so there, that's where you connect to source. That's where you connect to source or yourself, which is divine. Connect yourself, connect to source, whatever this is called. So, so in, in meditation, we get uh, glimpses of what is uh, beyond the mind. And just uh, let's um, have a look at what's happening to the mind when we are meditating. But first, um, we need to, uh, to understand what is the structure of the mind, how it functions, what are its, the mechanics of the mind. And as I said before, this is one map. This is really one map. There are many, even psychology has another map. It's not that this is the one. That's the one that, you know, we're, that I know. And that I can, it makes, it, that makes sense to me. And there are others that I was like, I also looked at and I was like, oh, that also makes sense. So, you know, you need to be open and say, okay, what can I get from here? What do I, and if it makes sense, take it. If it doesn't, please leave it. Please do. So listen to this, uh, how can I say, listen to this gently. Even don't try to necessarily understand. You know, listen to it gently, a bit as if you were listening to the rain falling down right now. Listen to it like that. And if you don't understand, it's okay. It's probably not your fault, but it's just my words that can't really explain. So um, one part of the mind is uh, called the manas. And this part of the mind is the reactive mind. And it's, it works through the senses. And um, it's actually uh, very useful. You know, you could say, oh, that's the reactive mind. Oh, no. Because it's, uh, it's designed to keep you safe. Everything that threatens, uh, threatens your life, manas would uh, react to it. That's one of the aspects of manas. And it can be at different levels, you know, not physically, but maybe because of your history or because of, you know, what you've, been go uh, what you've gone through through, uh, through life. There are things that make you react because it's almost to you, maybe not to me, but maybe to you, it is life-threatening. And we can't, it's, for each one of us, it's different. Uh, then there is uh, chitta, it's one other part of the mind, and it's where our memories are stored. So the conscious memories and the unconscious ones. And, of course, this has, um, this has a, um, an, an influence on your, on your present. You know, your past makes an impression and then you 
maybe you might choose from the past, from what you've experienced. So it has an impact on your, on your, on your life now here, those past experiences. But again, it's not only negative. This chitta also, kind of as I said, there are parts of it that are unconscious. You don't know. Certain memories that you don't know, you forgot, actually. But why they are hidden? No, would say, oh, it's just hidden there, I don't know. It's because also it's kind of a, a bit of a protection sometimes. Because maybe you're not quite ready yet to see it. So that's why it is a bit hidden. It's not that it has to remain hidden, but it's also a kind of a protective. Uh, aham kara, so aham is I and kara is the illusion. So it's, you know, the illusion of being separate. It's the, the ego, if you want to the lower parts of the ego. And again, this is not something uh, negative because we all have different personalities. And this really helps us to be in the world and to do what we need to do. If we don't have um, a healthy amount of ego, we can't do anything. So it's not about really uh, rejecting that because we're always like ego, ego, so much ego. It's just to understand again that th this might be useful. But to, um, to uh, really, how can I say, not act from, its, from the lower parts of it. And the problem with that also is that often we over-identify with the I, I am, you know, we over, that's, the ego in itself is not a problem, it's just we over-identify with whatever is after that, and we hold on it to it, we grasp it, we think that's who we are, I am, I am a yoga teacher, I am a mom. And it's kind of uh, scary to let that go. Because who are you if you are not that? It's scary. Um, and then buddhi is um, you know, the discernment, the, 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 the part of our mind that really decides how to act is the one who decides and who says who sees what is kind of good or bad to do but again it has um, different levels it can act and decide uh, because it wants um, immediate gratification for example uh, you decide you're gonna eat uh, the cake right now even if you're full but you like the you like uh, how I don't know, you want to eat, I, I don't know if it's a good example, but you have a cake and you eat one and then you eat another, it makes you feel good. But you feel that your stomach, you don't feel very healthy and you eat that cake and another one and another one. Because you think it's, it, it makes you feel good immediately. This is a bit of a weird <laughs> example. Uh, or you act um, and you understand that your action will give you a delayed gratification. You won't get the result immediately. Or you act uh, from, from the space which will serve your Dharma, which will really serve, you make the decision from that point, where it will serve what you came here to do. So, this part of the mind, which is deciding everything, is the part of the mind that is closest to Purusha, which is 
consciousness is a field of all knowing. It's kind of the same uh, is the um, uh, the same coin, but the both uh, the different parts of the same coin. So through this, if you sharpen your buddhi, you make it you make your perception more clear. You you um, you polish it. You can get in contact with this purusha and get kind of the info that you need. It's kind of um, I will show you the next. Um, the next slide, which explains it better, is like a line there between the buddhi and purusha. And this line is not a closed line, it's uh, perme you say permeable? Something like that. So if you polish that, or it's a door, let's say, but if you polish it, then the light of consciousness can shine upon the things, shine upon your mind and reveal reveal um, things that you were not aware of. So this is what is beyond. And you want to get uh, contact with it so that you, you understand yourself better. It's kind of a light which reveals. It's pure consciousness, all-knowing. It knows everything. And this is actually what is beyond, beyond the mind. And even beyond, I would say there is the absolute, beyond that consciousness. So, if the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is, infinite. So this is all about clearing the doors of our perception. And this is not a yogi who said it, but it could actually, is a very yogi, very yogic uh, quote. It's from William Blake, he's an English poet that I really like. So one way to clear the doors is uh, meditation. So, can you read? Are you not thinking what I'm not thinking? <laughs> so, you know, maybe, you know, I've, I've heard often people say, uh, my mind is uh, too busy, I can't me uh, meditate. My mind is busy too, I'm telling you. <laughs> my mind is too busy, I can't meditate. But really, who cares about that? Who cares if your mind is too busy? Nobody cares. <laughs> so that could be the reason why you choose to meditate. Or the reason why you, you say no. You choose. Because your mind is busy, you will meditate. Or because your mind is busy, oh no, I can't do this, I'm not going to meditate. You have the power to choose. And as I said before, um, it's really not about not thinking. It's not about that. It's not about not thinking. It's just a bit, what meditation is, is just to take a bit distance, a bit of distance, and design, uh, design, this identify <laughs> from what you're seeing. Just uh, establish yourself as a witness of what you're seeing. And you know, some days meditation will be, feel awful. It will. I mean, it still does to me, and I've been meditating for quite long. And sometimes it will feel like it's bliss. By the way, meditation is not about bliss, just for you to know. Uh, well, what I would say is just don't be attached to the outcome. It's not about the outcome. Just commit to your practice. Sit even a minute a day. A minute, 30 seconds.
And there is n really not such a thing as the best meditation. It doesn't exist. All types of me meditations are good. You just need to know for yourself what works and what you want from it. For example, here uh, we focus on, I, I'm just going to explain briefly, we, we do Kriya meditations. So those are meditation where we move the mind with energy. Because our minds is, are quite busy, one way would be to, instead of coming here and sitting immediately still, we move the mind with energy and then this will then calm it down. Just not forcing it down, but without going too much into detail, we take that path and then it will calm it down. But that's not the only path. There are other traditions which come, I mean, you know, for example, the Zen, they come and sit. I can't say it's wrong, it's just different. It's just different. And I can't talk about it because I've never done Zen, I mean, I'm not a Zen Buddhist, but I know that's how they do it. And uh, also, that the, um, another type of meditation we focus on here is mantra meditation. And I will talk about it later on. So, what I would say is like, just don't believe everything that you think. Your thoughts are really not you, even though they try really hard to be. They try really hard. They come back and come back and come back and come back. But if you look, if you really look, a thought comes and goes. And even if it's not here, even if it's spinning, maybe there's a second where that thought is not there. So you can't possibly be with that thought. You can't. Who are you then? Just if you notice, you're able to notice that, that space between the thoughts. Even if it's the same and same, same, and it makes you believe that's who you are, because you think it's always the same. I am this, 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 I am this. But there's a space between them. So what happens in that space of no thought? What is that? You can't be your thoughts because they come and go. And there's this saying from a Zen Buddhist that I really like. He says, uh, talking about thoughts and meditation, he says, um, leave the back door open, leave the front door open, let thoughts come and go, but don't serve them tea. It's, it's really the attitude to adopt here, whatever type of meditation you're doing. Because even, you know, when I do mantra meditation or I'm in Kriya, my thoughts still, I mean, I'm there and I'm like, oh, wow, I was uh, thinking of something else, actually. It also happens. It happens, you know. So just be aware of that. So really, our true, our true nature is beyond those changing thoughts. It's easy to say, right? But it's a bit, uh, sometimes, more difficult to feel. It's beyond that. Thoughts come and go, they change. There's something that's always there. Always, always. Always at rest. Not spinning. Peace. Silence. So that's normal. Actually, it's a black slide. And I wanted to stop here because, you know, we often say, uh, you are not your thoughts. Or even sometimes I hear myself say it and I'm like, oh, wow, I said that again. And I, I feel a bit scared that I'm not understood when I say, you are not your thoughts, you are that which experiences your mind thinking. Or you are not your emotions, you are that which experiences the emotions. Which is true, I mean. Ultimately, it's true. 
it is. But what happens there sometimes is that we, um, what I want to talk about is actually when we deny it. I want to talk about, you know, the spiritual bypass. We don't really want to see, we say, oh, I'm not that, I'm not this thought, I'm not this emotion. I'm not this, oh, it doesn't, it's, you know, the mind also tricks you there, you know. It minimizes the thing. And, uh, you know, for example, if you feel deep pain, you can't just go and say, oh, just get over it. It's not, it, it won't work. So you feel a deep emotion. You are not your emotion. Just imagine when you're feeling grief and somebody comes and you hear, like you are in grief, you come to my class and I say it. And I say because I, I think of the ultimate, uh, of its ultimate meaning. But sometimes I'm like, oh, wow, what if somebody is in pain right now and I'm saying that? How would that feel? How would that feel? And I'm like, oh, my God. That's why I want to clarify. So it's hard with words, you know. You say something and it can be interpreted in so many ways. So, yeah, ultimately, you are not those waves. And... I would change it a bit, it's not you don't become the ocean. I mean, if you don't become, if you don't realize that you are the ocean, you'll be sick, seasick every day. Do you understand? No comment. <laughs> and again, it's a, it's a quote from a singer <laughs> that I like very much as well. <laughs> There are a lot of yogis around. <laughs> so here, uh, just a few words about uh, mantra. So mantra is, um, uh, in tantric tradition, it plays really a very important role. And it's considered as the, as, um, the highest form of meditation. And it's, it's not simply... Um, uh, an object for focusing the mind. It's not only that. Actually, the mantra is, um, is considered as being the divine. It's the, it is the, the, divi the, it's the um, divine in the form of sound. So what happens is that... Uh, it is both a means and the source. So you use mantra, it's a means, a tool, to connect to source. So what you do is that first you repeat it. So it's really the mind, you know, you're using the mind, it's the mind who repeats it. Repeat, 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 om, 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 the mind. But at some point there's something else that happens. And again, you have to experience. I mean, it, it, it's irrelevant almost that I talk about it. Something else happens. It's like you, it starts happening on its own. It's almost like it's happening on its own and you get absorbed in it. Get absorbed in it and you absorb all its qualities. You become it. And it's a bit like, you know, we could compare that to looking at a landscape. If you look at a beautiful landscape, you look at that landscape, you look at it, in the end you let it come in. This is what is absorption. Or you look at the sunrise. In the end it's almost in you. You feel it in you. That's the absorption. So, just... <laughs> yes, I know I had to put it there, and just I have no comment there. <laughs> uh, and here, well, you know, I've, I've mentioned it before, the source, the source, what is beyond, beyond the mind. And... Uh, you know, you came here to find out what, lines, uh, what lies beyond it. And you know, it's funny because um, 
how can my mind tell your mind what is beyond the mind? How? So it's a bit like, you know, talking about love. Talking about it and you've never experienced it. I could talk about it till the end of times. From now on till we all die. I could draw it. I could write poetry about it. I could sing a song. I could explain its, you know, qualities. But you will never know what it is if you don't feel it. Never. No matter how hard I try, how long I try, never. So it's the same with uh, what is beyond. It's not something that um, we can grasp uh, with words. It's, it's not. It's the most intimate part of who we are. That's why for me it's quite difficult to talk about it. Because it feels a bit like talking about an intimate relationship. And I'm not really, it's not that I don't like to share, but it's not my way to share like that in public. <laughs> it's not that I want to keep it in, but it's not really my way. So, so this, what is beyond, is really the core of our being. It is always free and at rest. Always, always, no matter what happens. And actually, I feel that in the most difficult moments of my life. Because when I feel like I can't no more, I can't, I'm ahead to the ground. There's still something there. There is. And that's when I think I almost feel it most. What is beyond that pain, I feel it most there. And you know, as I said, it has many names. Many, many names. And we don't need to give one name to it tonight. Because, you know, I was thinking of my, uh, also reflecting about this notion of the divine and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, actually, I've, uh, I'm Turkish and I've grown, I'm, uh, I've grown up in Switzerland. So, uh, my grandma, Güller Roses, it's her name, um, she was praying to Allah. And she was very devoted, you know, five times a day she would pray. She would do her asana, you know. And uh, she's really a, this one of the sweetest human beings I know. <laughs> so she passed, but that's how she would do it. Then I had my friends from Switzerland, like my really close friends. Uh, they are like sisters. One is Buddhist. So she's also chanting mantra, but different ones. And uh, my other sister, um, she's Christian. My uh, brother-in-law is Jewish. So all of them do it in a different way. They all connect to what is beyond in a different way. So this all kind of changes forms, this what is beyond changes forms, but it has always the same quality, which is a sense of freedom, a feeling of freedom. And as I said, it's always at peace and it is all knowing. It is everywhere. It has thousand names.
So here we go. If you want to connect to that part of yourself that is beyond, I'm uh, having a re retreat in April, um, uh, the weekend of Easter weekend. It's three days where we'll practice in silence. Because actually for me, silence is really supportive of that connection. Because it's for me how I kind of, um, it really helps me to drop in. It's supportive. So it won't be full silence because we will practice and you will get the guidance there. But the silence will also support your journey inward. So please, if you need more information, just have a look at the website or... And please, yeah, if you are too busy to come, please come. I would love to have you there. <laughs> and I'd like to finish on that. Intellect takes you to the door, but it doesn't take you into the house. Thank you very much. <laughs>